attending this virtual Zoom meeting that the proceedings are being recorded. This meeting is not being live streamed. The representative of the sending district is authorized to vote on such matters that affect sending district students or affect the governance of the Princeton Public Schools as more specifically designated in NJSA 18A 38.8.1. In the event that this statute is amended, the law should take precedence over this bylaw. Sending district votes pertaining to personal personnel actions refer to high school central administration and district wide staff only votes otherwise are considered abstentions. Thank you. Matt, would you please call the order? I will. Uh, Beth Barrand. Here. Debbie Bronfeld. Here. Dan Dart. Here. Jess Deutsch. Here. Betsy Baglio. Here. Brian McDonald. Present. Michelle Tuck Ponder. Present. Peter Katz. Here. Daphne Kendall. Here. Susan Cantor. Here. We have a virtual quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the first item on our agenda tonight is item D1, adoption of minutes for March 17th, 2020 board meeting. Uh, could I have a motion? Could I have a motion? I have Michelle. In a second? Brian. Brian, thank you. I can't see my screen is frozen, so thank you. We have a, a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor of adopting the minutes, please raise your hand. I wasn't there, so oh, I wasn't there. You're right. I, I'm yeah, I have to abstain. So Jess is abstaining, Peter's abstaining, and yeah. Daphna's abstaining. No, no, no. I was there. I was uh, Susan. Susan. Abstaining. Susan, got it. Okay, motion passes. Motion passes by a vote. Do you want to say what the vote is, Matt, just to make it? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, seven yeses and three abstentions. Thank you. Next item is the adoption of the closed session minutes for March 25th, 2020. Can I have a motion? I can't see anyone, I'm sorry. Peter. Peter, a second. Dan. Dan. Matt, do you have the first motion and the second? I have Peter uh, motion and Dan second. Yep. Thank you. Is there any discussion? If none, uh, all those in favor, a show of hands. Are there any abstentions? I hear no abstentions. Okay, motion passes. By a vote of? Unanimously. Unanimous, okay. I honestly can't see, so we have to do this verbally. Yep. Um, the next item on the agenda is E1, student board members report. Do we have our student board members with us tonight? <laughs> we have Mateo. Mateo's there, but Mateo. Matt, you have to unmute him. I did before. Uh, let me double check, Mateo. Bear with me. Is Charlie with us? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I did. He may have re. Okay. Hello. There, you go. there he is. Oh, hi. Mateo. Well, um, hi, Mateo. I hope you are doing well. Um, Mateo, so I, I, Mateo, real quick, do you know if Charlie was supposed to be with us? I don't see him. I texted him and I forwarded him the email you sent me. Uh, he didn't respond. Uh, that was a few days ago. And then I texted him again today. He still did not respond. I don't see his name there. That's okay. Thank not you. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so I have a quick little report on remote learning. Uh, I just thought it'd be <laughs> right. the most important, considering that's what all the students are doing right now um, since we're out of school. Um, so I hope you all are doing well and staying healthy. Um, I thought, again, it would be a good idea to kind of report on remote learning. So for me, Navigating remote learning has been um, pretty self-explanatory. I log on to PowerSchool Learning every day. I get my attendance, um, and I check to see what each of my teachers have posted. Um, the workload has been manageable. I know most teachers said it'd be like two hours um, combined for each of your classes. So if you have four classes, you can have a total of like two hours um, combined for each class. And then um, I've also been receiving pretty good feedback from each of my peers. I mean, I talk to a lot of my friends every day. Um, we're all a bit sad, you know, considering we're seniors and not in school, hoping this will kind of pass over. Um, but they're doing well with remote learning. They're saying it's easy to get on, um, submit their work. Um, and I noticed there was a little bit of trouble I had uh, accessing the remote learning uh, in terms of like the websites the first few days. I think that was because there was a little bit of an overload um, with the number of students that were 
on the uh, PowerSchool Learning page the first few days trying to access their work. Um, aside from that, I've been doing pretty well. That was our main report for tonight. Um, again, I wasn't really able to get in touch with Charlie, but um, I talked to Mr. Bolden and he said also be a good idea just to report on remote learning. So that's how it's been going. It's been going very well for me and for my peers. Um, and I'm just taking protective measures, promoting social distancing, trying to not get sick over here um, and hoping we can get back in school as soon as possible. So, yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mateo. Thank you. Thanks, Mateo. Thanks, Mateo. Anyone have any questions for Mateo? I'm here for any questions about remote learning. Mateo, it's good to you have you with us. That you have two hours per class, and you have four classes in <laughs> the day. Um, so I have two hours. Um, it would be two. It's technically supposed to be two hours a day, split between four classes, and so it's been around that. It ranges because the teacher say I have a class on my E day. Um, they can assign something and have it do, you know, that next E-day. So it gives you an extra, like, day to do your work. So the work has ranged, but I haven't had um, as much as I would have expected, um, like, you know, kind of going past two hours, especially with my AP classes. It's been really reasonable. I've been able to get it done that day. Um, so not bad. I would say, yeah, it's about your range, but no more than two hours. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item is um, uh, harassment, intimidation, and bullying. We did that in closed session. That's a consent item. And we go to uh, my report. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for our first virtual board meeting in a new world of remote learning and working. We would be remiss at the outset of this meeting not to express our enormous gratitude to the healthcare and other emergency workers who are working tirelessly and selfly to fight the COVID virus on our behalf. We also express our sadness and regret for each of the precious lives lost to this terrible pandemic. The Princeton Public Schools have been fundamentally transformed by this crisis, yet we continue to pursue our mission thanks to the extraordinary effort and ingenuity of our staff, administrators, parents, and students over the past few weeks. We are particularly grateful for the strong leadership of Superintendent Cochran and each of us who have embodied school and love for our students. Together, we have transitioned nearly overnight to remote learning, continued to provide food for our children in the free and reduced lunch program, and moved forward with our work in a very challenging new normal that is likely to continue into the foreseeable future. Superintendent Cochran will provide more detail, but the planning and rapid execution by our staff and teachers of remote learning for our nearly 4,000 students was an enormous logistical and creative feat. There have been many bumps and much to learn from, but for the past few weeks, the vast majority of our students have been present and attending virtual classes from home, using a variety of platforms and innovative methods to continue their learning and connection with their teachers, counselors, and peers. Our technology department, led by Krista Galon, deserves a special shout out for their work virtually around the clock to deploy over 350 computers and iPads, hotspots and other devices to our students and staff in need of technological support at home. They continue to work nonstop to support students, staff and board alike as we navigate new technologies. The board is deeply grateful to an anonymous donor of funds through the Princeton Education Foundation for supporting our MAP technology access program and other efforts to promote equity in our schools. Thanks to creative procurement by our food service coordinator, Kaylee Dixon of NutriServe, and the logistical support of the transportation supervisor, Donna Braden and her team, nearly 500 children have been supplied with meals, and we are grateful to Ross Wishnick and the Send Hunger Packing Organization for taking on the task of helping supply these students with food through the weekends. As for our board work, we are growing with our students and staff and have gone virtual actively searching for an interim superintendent to be in place by July 1st, managing construction projects and engaging in other committee work all via virtual platforms. We are also monitoring new legislation and the financial implications of the current crisis while renewing efforts to find cost savings. Today, we will consider a resolution advocating against the adoption of a state law permitting municipalities to delay payment of tax levy funds to school districts, which would wreak havoc with our ability to run the schools. 
We are also taking a pause in our facility's master planning work with m and for the time being. I would like to close with two very important topics. First on communication. Please continue to let us know how you are doing and how we are doing. We are all in this together and need to learn and adapt as circumstances change. Please reach out via the chain of command, your children's teachers, principals, caseworkers, supervisors, and the board. Check out the PPS website, the Facebook page, Instagram, and the Twitter feeds. Write to us about what you would like to see more of. There are some wonderful postings there that our teachers and staff and, and students have put up and that have wonderful school spirit and show some of what they are experiencing. Um, from information about the remote learning, please see the resources on the remote learning page of the Princeton website. For up-to-date information on what is happening in our community on COVID, we have collaborated with the Princeton Li Public Library and the municipality to establish the PrincetonCOVID.org website. That's www.PrincetonCOVID.org. The site provides daily briefings from the mayor and other municipal officials and lots of other information. Um, as an example, today it listed that there are 28 cases of positive um, coronavirus in Princeton as of today. So they keep account and they explain what types of cases they are and who's being tested. For the latest statewide information, watch daily crisis briefings from Governor Murphy on the NJ.gov website. Again, it's NJ.gov and you can see there for the daily briefings, they happen around two o'clock every afternoon. The second topic and the last one I wanna talk about is spring break. Based on the advice of the CDC and our state and local authorities, we know that it is absolutely essential that we continue to practice social distancing. Many of our children will want to spend time with their friends over spring break. Many of us are finding it difficult to shelter in place and work from home with kids underfoot. Unfortunately, playdates, dinners together, even coffee with our neighbors just cannot happen now. We need to care for ourselves and for our community, and this means staying separate. We need everyone to hold the line and know that what we are doing will save lives and allow us to resume normal life sooner. Thank you. Steve? Thank you, Beth. Uh, Matt, if you can pull up the superintendent's report. Give me one minute. <clears throat> you could talk while I'm doing this. As Beth, uh, as Beth mentioned, we are very much uh, focused as a district on our mission of preparing all children to lead lives of joy and purpose as knowledgeable, creative, compassionate citizens of a global society. Um, and I think we see with this global epidemic how um, connected we are and how important that mission is. But our, um, our delivery of that mission has been fundamentally altered. If you can click to the next slide, Matt. There we go. Um, are you able to sc scroll down just a little bit more? There we go. Um, so the, the coronavirus has, has shifted in a, in a seismic way, um, the delivery of our mission. And I, I wanna be able to talk a little bit about um, some of those topics tonight, the remote learning, our, our distribution of food to our students, um, our focus on the, the mental health of, um, of our students, our staff, our families. Um, if we can switch to the next topic, the next slide, please, Matt. Um, it is clear to all of us that we are facing a, a very serious health crisis as a community and as a country. Um, today was, um, I think, the highest number of deaths that we have experienced in the United States, 785, prior to sitting down um, to speak to everyone tonight. Um, but it is a crisis that we are, are facing together. And to um, echo the comments that, uh, that Beth made in, in her remarks, we, we wanna begin by, by really saluting and, and thanking our healthcare professionals who um, are not sitting at home, um, but are very much on the, on the front lines in the hospital um, fighting this disease to, to the best of their ability. Um, and with this, um, we're grateful to have all of you here tonight with us. We have. Um, almost uh, 55 people right now um, watching this board meeting. 
to our students, our staff, our families, um, and all of our friends throughout the community. Um, we really just want to emphasize this, this message of stay home and stay healthy. As, um, as Ms. Barron said, this is, uh, the social distancing is crucial for us. Um, New Jersey has the, the second highest number of COVID cases in the United States. Um, as of yesterday, when I last looked at the numbers, New York was at 66,000 cases. New Jersey was next at 16,000 and climbing. And Michigan uh, was third with 6,000. So we are in the midst of this crisis and um, we're, we're still at the um, beginning stages. Um, the next few weeks are gonna be critical for us. And so the, there is this importance on staying home um, to keep ourselves healthy and to keep uh, the rest of our community healthy. If you can move to the next, the next slide. Social distancing, social connection. So um, as we've talked about, social distancing preserves our health, but it's our, our social connections that really preserve our humanity. And I truly believe that we need, we need both um, as a community to make it through this crisis. So um, social distancing. We as, as you all know, closed schools um, as of uh, March 16th. And that school closure is, uh, will last at least through April 17th, according to um, our governor, and is likely to last um, beyond that. The recommendations from the CDC regarding school closures that we received as superintendents were that they um, were less effective at two or three weeks and that would be much more likely to be eight to 20 weeks. Um, so we, we are preparing for, um, for not a sprint, but a marathon as we move forward. Um, and we also want to make a, um, a point of saying that as a, as a, a district, we want our staff to be at home um, where they are safe, and we are committed to paying those salaried employees during this crisis. Um, from the social connection aspect of this, that balance between social distancing and social connection, um, I am just so grateful for um, the way in which our staff, our students, our community um, has truly come together to teach, to feed, to counsel, to learn, to support, to support and to inspire one another. And uh, uh, Mateo was, uh, was kind enough to, to lead off on giving us, a, us some insight from a student's perspective on the remote learning, um, how we are teaching has, has changed in a significant way in the past two and a half weeks. Um, and I want to give Annie Kosick an opportunity to share a little bit about that from her perspective as our um, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction. And I really do wanna begin with praise for our, um, our teachers, our administrators, our counselors, our, our child study team members, the tech department, as Beth mentioned, that's been working so hard, and, and Annie's entire office of, of curriculum and instruction. Annie has really been the one to, to lead um, our district into this new era of remote learning. And um, so I did wanna give her an opportunity to talk us through um, some of the work that went into preparing for it, some of the things that we're seeing as highlights, some challenges that we are facing and some adjustments that we are making along the way. So Annie, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit for us. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Um, and I, I need to start by just saying that teachers are the true heroes in our school organization. Uh, what they have been able to do with just two and a half days of time to prepare for this is, has been nothing short of remarkable. So um, kudos to our teachers. Uh, every day I think about them and we try to do all we can to support what they are doing every day for our kids. Week one for us was pretty novel. Uh, we sort of had to learn as we went along. We were a bit overly ambitious, I believe, in that first week although I think we heard from parents uh, both sides of that argument. Some parents felt we weren't giving enough work. Some others thought we were giving too much. In our second week, we got a better balance, I believe. We got into a little bit better of a routine, and then some really exciting things uh, started to happen. Um, there were live lessons, uh, the phone calls that uh, teachers are making and the home, uh, emails that they send home. Uh, we have spirit days going on. Uh, the Little Brook teachers, as you know, did a, a parade. Uh, there are story hours, daily explorations. 
I received a video from a first grade teacher uh, from Littlebrook who had been using the focus period, you know, quite well for many years. And one of her students did a passion project at home where she choreographed her gymnastics routine to music. And it just warmed my heart to see that kids are taking not only the lessons that teachers are teaching remotely, but they're going uh, a bit farther too, even our, our youngest learners. So we are continuing to encourage our teachers to be flexible, to be compassionate, to, to open up to the silver linings that the, this, the opportunities that this has brought us. Um, so we are focusing on some guiding principles. And if you look at our website, um, you'll be able to see some of the uh, overarching uh, guidance that our, that our teachers are following in terms of trying to find a balance between um, work and home and play um, and social interaction that we need to achieve. Um, I'm, I was happy to hear Mateo's report um, that affirms for us some of the things that we are hearing, uh, some of the positive comments that we're getting from both students and, and families. Um, I, that doesn't go to, isn't to say that we're not also having challenges. We are, um, and we are addressing them um, every day. And I appreciate the feedback from parents as well. Uh, so all done just in, with a very positive spirit, but making suggestions that we've been able to follow up on to try to improve things uh, little by little. So we're in week three right now. Um, I, I think, uh, as I said, I think while we are still dealing with challenges and many of the challenges that Mercer County districts um, across the board are having, I think we are on firm ground. And as long as we continue to work together, uh, we did do a couple of parent surveys. Uh, Jason Burr at JW did a student and a parent survey after week went one, and then they did another one after week two. I haven't gotten the uh, data on week two yet, but his week one data um, showed that among the students, about 90 to 93% of the students felt very strongly that they were getting support from teachers and that completing their work was easy to moderate for them to do um, and that they were balancing their work time, screen time and downtime fairly well. Uh, parents gave us feedback um, about communication and about 82% of our families said that the communication from the school and the district was, was good. About 64% thought that the work was adequate um, and about 17% felt uh, that, it, that it was not either because it was too little or too much. We did have, uh, and Mateo mentioned that as well, a little bit of problem with our power school learning. Um, power school learning itself was having an issue, but once they resolved it at their end, it seemed to pick back up. Um, we've been asking all teachers, and parents, and students to go to their, uh, um, their lessons through power school learning, but the teacher then might link them to other platforms, um, Google Classroom, uh, Seesaw, Microsoft Team, they might be going to other platforms, but we're asking everyone to start with power school learning because that's also a means of our um, so monitoring attendance and monitoring um, kids engagement. So that, that helps us to do that. So going, going forward, we'll continue to learn and modify um, how we teach, how much we teach, uh, what we teach as we, go, uh, as we go along. We are looking at uh, grading and report cards and what that might look like, both at the middle and high school, we're coming up with a plan for grading um, and uh, we'll be getting that out to parents soon. I, I believe Jessica has already sent something out to high school parents on that, um, but we'll be getting more information out um, about that. Uh, most of you have heard already that all state assessments have been canceled this year, so um, we, we are not obligated to those, um, and uh, that will not have an impact on our uh, um, graduation requirements or any negative impact for our seniors um, or juniors. 
Uh, so we are, again, another thing we're doing going forward is making decisions about field trips that had been planned, uh, end of the year concerts, art shows, graduation ceremonies. We have all of that to look at and to, uh, to consider. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say too was uh, attendance. Uh, we are taking attendance at the middle and high school through a Google form. Um, once that attendance is taken that way, uh, Mateo mentioned that too. He said he goes into Power School of Learning and marks his attendance. We need to then get that information into Power School where we maintain our attendance record. Um, and so that process we're still working through. Um, but when we did a, a, a run of Power School attendance, we have at the high, in week one, we had about 84% at the high school, about 78% at the middle school, and the elementary schools were all 97 to 99%. Uh, so those may not be totally accurate though, because we're still checking our system and the transfer of information from one form to another. So, uh, so we are working on that, but attendance is, taken by uh, kids um, signing in that they are in the system. And it's also monitored by the daily work. Teachers are monitoring student work. And so they know that the kids are there and they're doing it. Um, and that's another way that we're monitoring it. Um, I, you know, I have a other, few other things I could talk about our, the, our math devices, our tech devices that we've handed out uh, to kids. Um, who are eligible for devices. We've got about um, 315 Mac MacBooks out, about 48 iPads, 220 hotspots are out, and we've loaned out about 20 Chromebooks to date. We still have some of those we can lend out for um, people um, who need additional devices. Um, and I think uh, I can stop there, and if there are any questions, I, I can answer them. Or any questions from board members? Danny, you mentioned that um, Power School as a way of tracking attendance, but also engagement. Can you just say a little bit about what engagement looks like on Power School or how, how we're using it in that way? Well, um, that's the starting point for all the teachers' work they do with kids. So once you go into Power School Learning, either lessons are there, there might be videos that they, they uh, the kids are um, engaging live with the teacher, maybe they're watching videos, but all of that is monitored. So we know when kids go into Power School Learning, when they, <coughs> and how long they have been on. So we, we, we know um, that, that they have participated in the work the teacher is given. Now, sometimes the, uh, the work that the kids will be sent from Power School to Google Classroom, or they'll be sent to I see. to do some of the work there. Mm -hmm. uh, the teacher is monitoring that by the, the as they're reviewing kids' work and interacting with kids. They know that the kids are on those sites as well. Thank you. So, Annie, I just wanted to say, um, really, thank you for your leadership on this. It's incredible um, what you you have uh, led your team to do um, over this very short period of time and. And I know I'm impressed with the learning that's happening. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, we briefly spoke at, in a student achievement last week about um, special education students. And um, I understand we'll be speaking about it um, at, our, at our April student achievement meeting, and then we can report back to the fuller um, board about it. But um, I don't know at what, what we can say this uh, at this point about um, how special education is going and, and what we see some of the challenges and how we'll address them. Yeah, so um, there, there, there's a broad range of special education services that we've provided, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, different levels of, of um, um, <laughs> certain levels of uh, classwork. Uh, of uh, types of classes that kids are involved in and also s extra services that they get. So uh, we are still working out and uh, Mickey and her group is, are still working out um, how we're facilitating some of that. But I know that we have speech teachers actually giving speech lessons. Um, we have um, OTs checking in with, uh, with families. 
a child study team, uh, special ed teachers. Uh, they're, they are, they're calling families, they're asking how they can be a further assistant. <clears throat> and teachers of the special education classes are also providing lessons and work for the kids as well. Um, so that is an area that we, uh, we, we do know that we need to offer perhaps some greater support. Um, but we're encouraging those families to really reach out and connect with case managers and with their teachers so that we know exactly what is, what is needed there. Thank you, Annie. Annie, is there any difference or any feedback about <clears throat> uh, the hotspots versus, versus, you know, cable or um, BIOS in terms of uh, their ability to access uh, remote learning? or um, the Chromebooks versus an iPad or, or a notebook? Um, well, the, the, um, probably the best, the, the best device that we have that we give out are the MacBooks. Uh, the, uh, um, I think those work the best for the programs that we have. The Chromebooks are suitable and uh, those are not part of our MAP program, but they are of our classroom Chromebooks that we use. So we dismantled a few of the classroom carts um, and got them ready for loaning. Uh, the hotspots, uh, you know, the feedback we're, we're getting on those, I think they're working fairly well, except that they are limited. Um, uh, and maybe Steve, you can even speak better to this than I, than I can, but they're limited in, in how, how, how much uh, kids can, can do with them. But, um, um, but, but so far they've been working. I think it would be wonderful if we had something stronger. For I think that, that actually Sprint who provides the hotspots increased the, um, uh, yeah. the amount of data yeah. that, uh, that we, our students can use each month. So I think we're fine actually for the, the, the hotspots at this point. It would have been a problem if they'd been st stuck at, at three gigabytes, which is what I think it was before. Thank you. Annie, it's Brian. Um, thanks for that. I guess I'd call it partly sunny um, assessment yeah. of how things are going after uh, two weeks. I wonder at our next meeting if we might have an opportunity to hear from um, some of our teachers, you know, about what life is like on the front lines. And I know it's probably very different at the elementary school level and at the, the middle school level and at the, the high school level. Um, but you know, as we think about remote learning and, and the role that technology you know, can play in, in learning, I, I'd personally just like to hear some more voices. I, and I think, that would be, I think that would be wonderful and I think they would love for their, their voices to be heard um, uh, by the board as well. Um, I will speak for them I, to, tonight and, and just say, well, they are doing a remarkable job, but that has come with a lot of hard work, a lot of frustration, a lot of challenges that they've, they've had to overcome. They have reached out to our technology department for help with the technology. Um, they, they have learned things, you know, on the spot to get things up and running. They are, are putting in hours and hours of work at home, um, many more than you can imagine. Um, and, and so, um, yes, I, I think it would be wonderful to, to hear from them. And I, I think you will hear both the joys and the frustrations for them. I want to, um, again, thank you, Annie, for all of your incredible work that is ongoing as we continue to make, make adjustments here. Um, I know for our youngest learners, K through two, we started with paper packets for those students, and now we're transitioning those students to um, more virtual learning, and that will be a challenge for our teachers, for our, for our kids, and for our families. So, you know, another shout out to all of our, our parents who we, we know how disruptive this switch has become for, for families as um, there's competition for devices among students or among parents who are now being um, asked to work from home as well. Um, so there's lots of negotiating, I'm sure that is happening in each household. And um, I wanna sort of emphasize some things that Annie had said about we're, we're striving for the remote learning to make it manageable and meaningful. Um, and we want learning to uh, continue uh, and, and progress and towards the, the standards that, that um, 
we have for our kids. At the same time, we recognize that life is very different um, than it has ever been. And there are a lot of stresses and pressures and um, adjustments that are being made in every household. And, uh, and so we're, we, we are grateful for, those, for the parents who are making those adjustments and helping to make those. And don't, don't be afraid to talk to us about um, the workload or, 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 or shifts that, that, that can be made. Um, and also um, to, again, begin and where Annie began in, um, in talking about our teachers as true unsung heroes here. They have, um, not only are they teachers, but they're also parents. So they're often home with their own kids and still trying to um, uh, instruct and counsel and support um, the students in our district. And uh, we're, we're incredibly grateful uh, for that effort. So moving to um, the next area of, of real responsibility for us as a district, um, we're responsible not only for, for educating all of our students, but certainly for, um, for feeding them, and particularly those students who, are on, uh, who qualify for the federal lunch program. Um, one of our obligations, and we are um, grateful and glad to be able to have this um, opportunity, is to feed those students during this time when we are not in school. So we have 500 students in our district who are eligible for, for breakfast and lunch. Um, and, our, and our challenge that we faced when we switched to remote learning was um, to provide meals for them each day and, at this, and to do it in a way that kept our, our staff, our food workers, and our families safe at a time when we know we had a, a global pandemic and a, and a spreading virus. Um, <laughs> so there were some districts that went to uh, um, a distribution plan where students came to the school site and were given meals um, there. And what they saw was um, a decreasing number of students who were actually availing themselves of that opportunity. Um, there was a, um, those, that model put um, food workers in the building every day and it also brought families and students to the building. And so um, it, it worked in, um, contrast to the, the gov governor's order to try and limit the amount of, um, of public exposure that people had. The plan that we developed in Princeton has, and I have to say, much like the, the um, remote learning, it's a plan that's evolving. And so as I talk this through, you'll see how um, our initial plan has evolved in each iteration and will continue to. So um, initially, when we began on March 16th, um, we we're going to have um, two weeks of meals for our students. And we had a, a distribution system of using 14 buses as mobile meal distribution sites that we would um, drive to various neighborhoods throughout our community so that they were um, relative walking distance for our students and families. Our plan was to have one box of food per student. And initially we had, we. Um, place two weeks of meals in those boxes. So 10 breakfasts and 10 lunches. We had a fairly basic shelf stable menu. Um, and that model did work well for us. Um, we were able to feed almost 90%, more than 90% of our students, uh, whereas other districts were um, probably in the 30% or lower um, level. The, the second distribution of food, which happened this past Thursday, um, we put a month's worth of meals together. Um, and the reason that we did that is we, we really did want to feed our students over spring break and make sure that they had food. We were not obligated to do that, but we felt it was the right thing to do. And so we, we actually had, um, on Thursday, we had two distribution um, cycles. One was in the morning where we, we gave the box of food um, and then we came back in the afternoon with um, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so lettuce and carrots and oranges and apples. So that was an addition to um, of the fresh fruits and vegetables was an addition to our menu from the first um, iteration. Uh, we will be following up uh, with the delivery on April 14th, I believe, where we are going to be providing um, those families with um, another loaf of bread for each student, um, as well as with um, the, the SHUP organization, Send Hunger Packing Princeton, um, that provides meals on the weekends for students. We'll also be, give, we'll be doing a distribution of food um, using our, our 14 mobile meal distribution buses. 
and we are looking to get uh, um, a package of, of toiletries, uh, hygiene necessities through a drive that human resources had, had run in town so that we can distribute those to families as well. Um, so that will happen, we hope, on April 14th. Moving forward, um, my recommendation is going to be that we move to a once a week model of distribution, um, that we have a menu that, that varies um, each day, um, and that we use an outside company to help us with um, meal preparation and, and placement in easy to carry bags with handles. Um, the distribution of, and there's, there's a several reasons that I'm making this recommendation. One is that on the, the front end, the actual packing of boxes with meals and with fruit and vegetables, uh, we have sort of an assembly line set up that uh, has multiple staff members, um, mostly our bus drivers and, um, and assistants working with our food service workers, um, working in relatively close proximity, closer than I, I would want them to um, for, for safety reasons. Um, and on the other end, when we are distributing the food in a box and it has a month worth of food or even two weeks, those boxes can be heavy um, and hard for people who have uh, multiple blocks to walk. So um, the idea of going to once a week um, means that we will have, um, and using an outside company to prepare means that we will uh, limit the, um, the need on the front end for packing the boxes. Um, and on the distribution side, it'll be much easier for, for people to carry. Um, so we're looking forward to that. The company that we're hoping to work with um, is going to be uh, flexible with their menu. So we're, we're, we're going to get some samples, but we're, we're hopeful that the, the food will, will, have, will be balanced and varied and, um, and meet all the USDA, the USDA requirements. If you can move to the next slide, I sort of want to continue um, talking about food distribution. As I mentioned before, the outcome um, of our model was one of, of getting food to 90% um, of our students. Um, it's a model that is being replicated by other districts as they see the benefit of being able to make a single delivery that's effective in getting food to people and that limits the, um, the amount of time and, and that, that, that families need to be together in one place and that food workers need to be together in one place. Um, there was discussion uh, as we were implementing this, this model. Um, we did it on March 16th. On March 20th, there was a law that came out from um, the legislature that um, threw a little bit of confusion into the mix in which they talked about we, if you were dropping food off at someone's door or you were using a bus to drop meals off at a, in a sort of a bus stop, like going like they would on a regular bus run in the morning and, you know, eight o'clock, they're at one house and they're at one bus stop and eight ten, they're at a different stop, that you had to limit the, um, the food to three um, days worth of meals, no more than that. Um, and we initially had done two weeks. Um, we, we did get clarification that we were actually in line with the law because we were using our buses not, as, not to deliver, but as distribution sites, so as an extension of the school. Um, but then uh, this weekend, the Department of Agriculture, which actually runs um, the Federal Food Lunch Program, came out with a clear um, statement that the, the law from May 20th actually did not apply to any schools that were closed because of the governor's order. Um, so just because there was some confusion on that in the, in the public, I wanted to make sure that the, um, the community and the board knew that we were in complete compliance, as our attorney had told us. Um, with the law and with the expectation and that the model is one that is actually being um, looked at by the Office of Emergency Management and, and, and viewed as, as uh, a good balance between getting the food to students and keeping students and staff safe. So the, um, the praise for this, um, again, there are some amazing unsung heroes in this, this, this work that we're doing. Um, Kaylee Dixon, the director of NutriServe, um, has been working around the clock. Um, I had calls from her at Sunday at 10 o'clock at night saying that she you know, couldn't get a particular item and could I, she substitute something else. Um, Donna Braden and her transportation staff, we have 14 drivers, um, 14 aides. They came in last Thursday and they were helping to pack those boxes, um, move them onto the buses, distribute them to families. Um, 
We have our, our parent liaisons, our family, our community liaisons who um, connected with all of the families to make sure that they knew about the distribution times and sites. So Liliana and Trinidad and Lenora, um, huge thanks to, to them. And then um, we have a number of community partners who have joined us in this work. So Send Hunger Packing, Human Services, the Princeton Children's Fund, Arm in Arm, um, the Y has helped us. Princeton University has reached out to our food service director to see if they can help with um, procuring um, uh, staples that maybe we can't because of supply line issues. So we have a community that is coming together um, to look at food insecurity, not just for, for children, but for our town. And when we step back and look at the larger picture, um, we know that as this crisis continues, um, it's going to create economic hardship uh, for more and more families and that we are going to see an increasing number of food insecure children and adults. Um, and so we are, we are truly in this work together. Um, this morning I was on the phone with a number of the organizations that are distributing food to, um, to children and adults and we are trying to join forces and uh, figure ways to um, ensure that there are no, no people who are going hungry in Princeton. Um, if you go to the next slide, Matt, um, Beth had mentioned this in her comments, this, um, this, this um, single site that Princeton has put together, um, princetoncovid.org. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a one-stop go-to site for um, anything related to our response to the um, COVID-19 crisis. Um, so if you need help or if you are interested in volunteering or helping in some way, um, you can go to this site and there are a set of um, how to help um, or if you need help and food resources that are available or ways to volunteer or donate. Um, so I just want to make a pitch for people um, frequenting this site. There is a lot of very, very helpful information. Any questions from the board on uh, food distribution? I just wanted to add, if I could, Steve, um, just three things. Um, the first one is uh, the, I just wanted to give a shout out to the Pinnell Mobile Pantry, which yes. um, it has been supplementing um, some of the food the district's providing. And the, um, the PTOs uh, of our school have been um, great in sharing the messages. Mm -hmm. And our families uh, really contributed um, um, a large amount of food. I was at the pantry helping. and and. The, it was it was full. Um, the second one, so thank you to all everyone who's helping with that. Um, the second uh, thing I wanted to mention was um, share my meals, and um, the the head of that is Isabel uh, Lambote. Um, I spoke with her today. They're they're providing 160 65. meals. Sorry, 165 oh. meals a day. Yeah, it's five wonderful. meals a day. Um, and they're doing it very responsibly. Um, they're either delivering it to um, a family's porch and calling them to make sure they get it, or they're having them come by. Uh, right now there's two restaurants, Mezzaluna and the Meeting House, and um, they're having the families come and pick it up um, at a scheduled time. So I just wanted, and again, I just wanted to thank um, our PTO leadership, um, uh, Little Brook, um, just to give them a shout out, but right before we closed our schools, they authorized a $5,000 emergency fund so that they could use that money to support our community. Um, so thank you very much for that. And um, John Witherspoon, um, PTO, um, Kim Marks and Mara Olmstead have been great um, asking how they can help us communicate what our community needs. So just to add to the praise that you've been providing. So thank you. Well, and I should add that uh, uh, you were there on Thursday handing out boxes of food to people, Daphna, thank you. I know that uh, Debbie too was at the Pinnell Center giving um, um, boxes of food to people and, uh, and our own uh, Matt Bolden, our BA, when we, when we didn't have boxes, um, uh, went to, got a truck from the district and went to Home Depot and got 400 boxes <laughs> at the last minute so that we could put it all out together for, for families. So there are a lot of people who are contributing to the effort. And I can say, Steve, that I saw you carry one of those 25 pound boxes, several blocks. Uh, <laughs> So, it was it was towards almost towards Nassau Street from yeah. CP. So I came back and said, "We are changing this, and and it's got to be um, manageable for people." Absolutely, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve, while the Princeton COVID um, site is still up, I just wanted to 
um, extend a shout out to the library, which has really reprioritized their work um, in uh, impressive ways. And uh, Tim Quinn and the team of communications professionals there have done absolutely outstanding work and they're putting in you know, 10 and 12 hour days to keep that site up to date. And I also wanted to recognize Mayor Liz Lempert for the incredible work that she's been doing, including her daily updates and getting on calls uh, with the mayors across the country, to try to make sure that we're, you know, as a community, we're aware of and able to implement best practices. So thanks to Liz, thanks to Tim and the team there and everybody at the library. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, moving on. Um, just some quick comments about um, spring break. Um, so spring break is coming next week, um, April 6th through 10th. And um, we truly do hope it is a time uh, for all of us to, to relax, recharge and, and reset for um, the weeks and months ahead. Um, all of the, the districts in, in Mercer County are holding to their uh, previous planned spring break. Um, superintendents in Mercer County uh, get together um, virtually either uh, through Zoom conversations or texting on a um, almost um, certainly a weekly basis, sometimes daily. Um, so I know that spring break is something that is, uh, is, is being held to across the, the county, but we also recognize that spring break comes this year with um, some very different set of challenges. So there are no, no camps, there are no sports, there are no family vacations, there are no trips to the public library in the morning and um, you know, play dates at the playground in the afternoon. Uh, and we know that uh, many, many parents are now working for home, from home, must continue to work from home, and they no longer have the, will not have the structure of remote learning um, for their children during that time. Um, so we do know that this spring break is a different one and comes with, with challenges, but we also um, recognize that it may come with some possibilities and that's something as, as Annie had said, there's the silver lining in um, so much of the, the shifts that we are making. And so there has been discussion about what kinds of uh, both real and virtual experiences can we provide to our, our kids and our families so that they, um, are, are happily and safely engaged uh, during the spring break. So um, there, there's, uh, we are gonna be able to put out um, uh, links to a wide range of, of possibilities, um, but it could be creating songs either individually or collectively, um, doing scavenger hunts, book groups, uh, creating gardens, doing virtual tours of museums, watching movies together maybe as a, um, as a grade level, as a school, as a community, doing nature walks, art projects. Um, so the district um, is pulling together a variety of activities and we have some of those already together in a, in a virtual binder that we're gonna be putting on our website. We're also trying to curate with the surrounding districts some of the activities that um, they are developing. So we look forward to putting that out as a district. At the same time, the, the PTOs are engaged in trying to um, develop some activities as well, and maybe across district, um, some, some challenges or some experiences, um, some celebrations. And I would um, use this opportunity to reach out to our, our community. If there are um, things that uh, we, the, the Arts Council or uh, and the library is working so hard, if they've got virtual experiences they can provide, the university, the Institute for Advanced Study, if there are lectures that are online that maybe all of us can watch together, um, so we are trying to be creative in the next week and, um, and come up with um, exciting, interesting, and safe ways uh, for our students to be, to be engaged when they are at home. Um, any questions about that? Steve, I just want to jump on um, and add to what Brian said about the, um, the library and um, the website that we've referenced a couple of times, PrincetonCOVID.org, there is already a treasure trove of Great. activity up under Just for Kids on that site. So I think that's gonna be a major resource during spring break and I okay. encourage people to check it. Thank you, thanks Jess. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, and uh, the next area. Um, this is, uh, I think we all recognize, a, a time of heightened anxiety for, for all of us. Um, and our school counselors uh, have been uh, 
sort of the cheerleaders for their school communities, uh, trying to bring people together in a, a time of, of difficulty and anxiety. And so um, they have been organizing spirit days and celebrations, whether it's, uh, you know, crazy hat day or mixed match, mixed, mis, mixed matched sock day, or, you know, take a picture with your pet day and post it online. There have been all kinds of opportunities for kids to be sort of um, happily engaged and for, for, for teachers and adults to jump in as well um, with these school-wide challenges and celebrations. Our counselors are also um, meeting regularly with, with their kids. Um, and they're doing it in a number of ways, through Zoom, through Google Hangout, through their PowerSchool Learning um, platforms, uh, through phone, through email. Um, they have been holding um, the lunch bunch sessions that they might have been having um, when we were meeting prior to, to March 16th. Uh, they're continuing those and maintaining contact with students, um, particularly reaching out proactively to those students who they had a relationship with, who they knew were experiencing heightened levels of anxiety or greater stress prior to um, the, the COVID crisis. Um, so I, I really do want to um, highlight the work of our counselors. Um, and our mental health professionals during this time. Um, our um, supervisor of school counselors, uh, Christina Donovan, is going to actually be joining um, our mayor, Liz Lempert, for one of her briefings to talk about mental health supports and the importance of um, maintaining um, mental health and reaching out for help if needed um, during this time for all of us. Um, I think uh, as families, we're seeing a, a heightened level of anxiety. Um, we do have this link on our website. We have mental health resources uh, for anyone who may need to have a talk to a counselor when, when we don't have counselors available, whether it's on the weekend or um, over spring break, but I wanna point that out. It's on the counseling site as well as the, um, the coronavirus update site that the district has. In addition, I just wanted to read this, um, if you can go to the next slide, this letter that, that uh, Christina Donovan wrote to our community and um, I think that it, it, it actually captures so much of what I believe is, is most important about where we are right now and how we are functioning as a community. And she writes, I became a school counselor for Princeton High School because I believed in the power of love, care, connectedness, and compassion when working with students. I knew that if I loved them unconditionally and provided support that together we would overcome almost any obstacle. It is in that spirit that I write to you all today. I know that times are difficult right now. I know that some of you may be hurting, scared, out of work, or have food insecurity. You're missing your friends, your extended family, your colleagues, maybe your favorite restaurant or record exchange. I also know that as a community, we can either divide or we can rally together. I don't have answers for you, but I do have counselors. Counselors who share the same philosophy, philosophy that I did many years ago when I started. Counselors who want to be here for you and for your family, please reach out. Every Princeton Public School counselor has a Power School Learning page, or you can set up an appointment via email. You are not alone. We see you. We are still here. I think that captures for me um, what is most important about the work that we're doing right now is that we are connecting to our kids. Um, and that's our counselors. Um, it's our child study team members, it's our teachers, but the most important thing is that human connection. Um, the learning is secondary, it's important, but it's secondary. Um, and I am grateful for all of our professionals for the, the way they have maintained those connections um, with our students throughout this crisis as it's beginning and as it continues. Um, and then the final slide, Matt. Um, this is one where I do see our schools as, as beacons of hope and schools are not, they're not buildings, they are people. Um, and we continue to be a school, even though we may not be in a building, we are still connected. And on, on Friday, this past Friday, Little Brook um, got together and said, we wanna, we wanna reach out to our kids even beyond the computer. We're going to um, uh, visit them in our cars and they had a, uh, practicing social distancing, and we had it all approved by the Board of Health, but they, they got together um, in their cars. They had ravioli, the, the school mascot, um, in the back of uh, the principal's uh, pickup truck, Louis Ramirez, who's pictured here, um, and they, they designed a route that took them through all the neighborhoods where their students were. The students knew they were coming, and 
um, on the sidewalk, waving at them as they went by. And it was a, a really remarkable um, day. So uh, Matt, I don't know if you have the 20 second video we can play of that. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Little Brooks Teacher Parade. This was the brainstorm of one of our second grade teachers, Mrs. Laura Carlone, so we thank her for that. And also want to thank everyone in the Princeton community for coming out to support us and all the wonderful teachers that are out here today who are taking part in this parade. Stay well and we miss you. Thank you very much, Matt. Any questions, comments from, from the board? Steve, I just want to say the parade went down my street and it was fabulous. All the kids were out, they had streamers, they had banners. And you know, it was even great. Um, somebody in our neighborhood told everybody. So actually everybody was out, even though oh, yeah. they were out, yeah. It was, um, it was really uplifting to see the parade and to see all the- Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, I got, I got emails from a lot of people who don't have schools in the system who were, who were excited about it. Mm -hmm. So we thank them. Beautiful. Yeah, Steve, I just wanted to echo your um, praise for our, our counseling department. I think, um, you know, like uh, you and Annie have said, the silver lining, uh, there are some silver linings in some of this situation. And, and for me, in addition to our administrators and, uh, and our teachers, um, Christina Donovan is, is one of those um, bright spots because uh, she sent some of us an email today just detailing uh, all the things that she's put into place since this um, pandemic uh, started to help um, our kids adjust. And so I just wanted to add my praise to yours. So thank you to Christina and all the counselors. Thank you. Steve, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, this is all, I, I just think it is it's so wonderful. And I know a number of us on the board have heard from, from friends and family around the country about how they somehow went remote without any preparation. And some, you know, a lot of kids were sitting home and waiting to hear how it would work for them and a lot of uncertainty. And so I just, I just really want to compliment you and your team and the teachers. It's amazing what we've, we've done here. Um, something I'd be interested in hearing going forward is how we're keeping track of the kids who aren't logging in, mm -hmm. who, you know, what is the, I guess you said 84% at PHS the first week. So mm -hmm. we know that there's probably, you know, 15% or so of the kids that we're not seeing at all. And how are we keeping track of those kids and how are we making sure they don't fall in the gap? You know, as we've been talking about with the food, we're trying to figure out where are the gaps. Yep. So our students, you know, we know there are some that we really need to kind of keep, keep hold our arms around virtually and I don't know how yeah. we're going to do that. Yeah, you, I mean, actually this, this came up at the very first admin team meeting um, that I held virtually um, um, last week. And uh, we, we identified the, the, the need to call those students. And I think that is happening to actually pick up the phone, call them if we need someone who speaks Spanish to do that, to make sure um, that it's not a, technical issue um, and if it is let's resolve it and if there's something else that we can do um, how can we support um, we know that there's a need for um, potentially for virtual tutors um, to be able to assist some students who may be having difficulty and may not have someone at home who can help them uh, mm -hmm. so we are trying to look at all those things you're asking the absolute right question yeah. thank Steve, you i know that when we use statistics and and talk about um, groups of children most people um, think about the general education population. And I just, I'm curious about what extra efforts we're able to make to connect with members of the special education population um, who you know, have a, a varied and different set of challenges as we try to engage every member of the school community. As Annie said, we, uh, and we have a significant percentage of our students who, um, have individual educational plans and there's a, a range of those needs. So some of those students are responding really well to the, um, the visual learning and the, the engagement that teachers have created, but, but clearly there are some students that we um, have to take different approaches with. And, um, and so we, we are working really carefully with, with teachers and, their, and child study team members, supervisors, to try and figure out just the right ways to, to address the needs. 
Um, and it is a challenge. Um, I, 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 at this point, I can't say that we are um, perfectly meeting the need of every, of every um, student with um, an IEP. And so we are continuing to have conversations with their families, um, with the child study team and the case managers and, and see how we can, can do that moving forward. But you're, you're right to point that out. It's very important that every single student um, has their needs met. Okay. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, are we ready then to move on to the financial status, the referendum? Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. This is item H2 on the agenda for those that are following along online or somehow otherwise. It is not pulling up. Hold on. There we go. Come on. You've memorized it all, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, uh, this is what I've been sharing the last few months uh, at our uh, regularly scheduled meetings. Um, unfortunately, there's a little more red um, as we're moving forward. Um, you know, all the factors combined right now, uh, we're estimating we're short $515,000. That does include um, some costs that are not finalized yet. Um, so from the uh, original contract with Epic, uh, originally the uh, referendum was gonna be over a shorter time period. So this has come to light over the last few months. So we're working on finalizing, you know, if we need them another seven months, it would be $18,950 a month. Uh, so it'd be another $132,650. And potentially we were talking before about using a third um, a project manager over the summer, which would be another $37,900. I'm not sure whether we're gonna go uh, there yet. Um, you know, we have our PHS project will be uh, ready to bid um, in about two weeks, we hope. Um, there's been some, you know, <laughs> we're actually having a hard time getting some answers from a couple agencies. The Delaware Delaware Raritan Canal Commission is, we're not sure if they're working or not, um, but we will likely go to bid. Uh, we think we've met what they've asked for. So we're trying to get some answers there. We should be going out to bid in a couple of weeks. Um, the plan is to award in uh, very early June and to start that work. Um, that's, that's, you know, about all. I mean, we are, uh, you know, we're tracking um, over budget on the referendum. We have worked in some, uh, a release valve going forward. Um, so we pushed back, I think I mentioned this before already, but the HVAC work at JP will be pushed back the next summer. And we will use, the plan is to use, uh, hopefully little, but some of our capital reserve as part of the budgeting process to uh, finalize the projects that were um, promised to the community and the schools. Um, there is also an agenda item on tonight for a change order at CP. We've been working really closely for the last four and a half months that was awarded um, on November 19th. So it is now four and a half months. We've been trying to work through a possibility of a change order to enhance the, uh, the design there. However, uh, it's very difficult once we've awarded a bid and uh, struck a contract to negotiate effectively uh, all the leverages with the contractor because we're in a legal contract. So we were trying to go back and forth and get the best possible price, but it was going to be uh, well over $100,000 ad. And uh, we have decided uh, the facilities committee and administration together have decided at this point that uh, we're not going to do that. However, we are able to enhance the project, uh, not quite as fully for a slight credit. Uh, about $5,400. Uh, it's on the agenda tonight. Um, I think I hit the high notes here, um, although they're a little mostly low. 
Uh, did I miss anything uh, that you can think of, uh, Susan or Brian? I could just offer a, a clarifying point. Um, mm -hmm. When we see the red, it's important for everybody to understand that it's really the difference between the estimates that were made in um, 2018 and the actual costs of the contracts awarded. Um, the projects have been coming in um, very cleanly with not many change orders. And, uh, you know, the, the EPIC team has done a, a very good job. Dave and his team have done a good job. The facilities committee has been very vigilant. Um, and we are going to have some robust discussion at our next two facilities committee meetings about some of the reasons why there were differences um, between the estimates and the contracts that were awarded. So it has nothing to do with, um, uh, so far we've been managing the projects well, um, but the, the financial challenges um, are, they're real, but they're not a function of uh, errors made during, you know, the actual implementation of the referendum. Thank you, Brian. Can I ask a question, um, Matt? You mentioned about the up the the change orders that the facilities committees decided not to move forward with those. Can you just explain? So the original designs will go on as planned. You said there are some upgrades. Uh, so we uh, at CP there was after the fact some um, discussion with the referendum team there to um, change the from the original design. Um, and we do so there was two change orders we were looking at. So we had them both priced um, the uh, I think the one that they most wanted most uh, was about one hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars. And then uh, the other one that we are going to do is a credit. And that also is preferred over the original design that went to bid. And that change order for a credit um, we're putting on the uh, agenda tonight. And that was CP only? CP only. Thank you. Correct. You're welcome. Matt um, and Brian, maybe this is going to come up in your report, but I think it's important that we mention to people that given the current crisis and the current state of emergency, that there obviously has been a lot more uncertainty in terms of supply chain and costs going forward. So that even if we do get these approvals that we're hoping to get from the state and move forward, you know, we may be faced with supply issues. I think there's a question about getting glass right now, glass suppliers are shut down. So we do face a lot more, unfortunately, um, uncertainty given the current um, COVID situation that could again impact our ability to get these projects done as, as in a timely manner as we wanted to. Yeah, it is still the intent to put the um, high school and related remaining projects out to bid in the middle of April. But we had a conversation um, earlier today on Zoom with the facilities committee and the construction manager and the architect about those challenges. And, um, you know, we're, we're not the only ones going out to bid. And it'll be very interesting to see how many contracts are actu actu contractors are actually able um, to submit solid bids because they may have challenges getting uh, numbers from their subcontractors. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's very unsettled. It's, you know, we're doing the best that we can and um, every week things are changing. Um, on the plus side, um, work has been moving forward um, in, well, I'll, I'll leave that to later in terms of the committee. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions on the referendum financial status? If not, um, we are going to go on to committee reports. It's item I1, um, uh, the first committee we're going to hear from. And again, I think tonight we're just doing uh, summaries of our reports because most of them are posted online. And um, if they're not, they will be shortly because I think there's two that aren't. Um, the first one would be equity. Michelle, do you have a summary for us or a report? Michelle, are you there? I don't. I think her, she can't. She's she can't. You had, Matt, can you unmute her? Yeah. I can't see anyone uh, either, guys. Held up a sign that said "Help." <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I can't see anything. I just see I black. I can't see her either. I can see she's muted. We got you, Michelle. Help is coming. Yeah. Help is coming. Hang on. Matt is coming. 
seconds on Azure. There she is. There she is. All right. Yes, yes I've been muted for the last <laughs> half hour. <laughs> Did you have any? I think I was wrong. <laughs> Do you have anything you wanted to say about anything previous? <laughs> I can't remember now. <laughs> Sorry. We're glad you're back. That's okay. <laughs> we missed. <laughs> okay. Well, how about equity? Equity. We had we met on uh, March 9th. We had a presentation from Panama, Panorama Education about helping us conduct or construct an equity dashboard, which is, um, and I'll keep it very brief, but it's basically a way for us to collect the student voice and the student experience around equity and um, equity issues and, and how students feel like they're treated in school. And the, and the great thing about it is that it's a, it's a survey that's taken over the course of several years. So you can see, you can measure improvement, you can you know, start to pinpoint um, different issues and address different issues that can come up continuously as opposed to you know, trying, to, trying to figure it out from, from our perspective as people who are not in the schools at least. Day. So, so that was, um, and it, it's also a, a school climate survey. So um, that was that was a great um, presentation. We also had some conversation about uh, creating an equity impact statement. And you've heard us talk about this over the past couple of months. We have a subcommittee. Things we've we sort of fallen off track because of all the things that have been going on but hopefully we'll be able to convene an equity um, subcommittee, impact statement subcommittee, and um, our meeting, which we were supposed to have a joint meeting with um, SAC, the Student Achievement Committee, but we've decided to postpone that until May. So the equity committee will be meeting on April 13th via Zoom, and we'll figure out how we're gonna get that done. Thank you. you have any questions for Michelle? Michelle, the Panorama is a K through 12 dashboard, or is it just the high school? No, actually, it's younger. I think, and somebody helped me if I, I think I remember correctly that they thought um, that younger students um, really couldn't respond, I don't want to say accurately, but in a way that they could come up with a consistent measurement. So I think the, the survey started with kids in the older elementary grades. All right, um, facilities, Susan and Brian. Yeah, I could, I could start and then Brian could add on anything. Um, you know, we were doing, we continue to do work um, on the outside of the buildings other than at JW where the demolition um, continued as our buildings were closed and will continue. Um, so outside, Epic's been working with PSNG, PSENG to see if they can get their transformer work done over what was our break as planned. Um, but we have decided uh, with the recommendation from Dave Harding and Steve to right now not open any of the other buildings besides JW for inside work. Um, and then we can reevaluate that in a few weeks, depending upon um, the health situation in our county. Um, so we continued with the demolition work that um, seemed to go, to go smoothly and they will continue working in the next couple of weeks. And they might even be able to get a little ahead in where we might've been should school have been not remote. Um, later, we'll later we'll make that decision on CP. But um, I want to thank uh, Dave and Matt for all the effort they put in. Um, you know, in a difficult situation where a bid had already been awarded, um, and then we hopefully will be able to get the PHS bid out and get some bids that uh, might allow us to start the work this summer as you know we'd like to be able to do that but in this climate we're just not sure what the results are going to be um 
So I guess that's our short ver version of the report and it's attached. Uh, Brian, do you want to add anything? Uh, only, I guess, two things. One is uh, you know, we saw pictures today of uh, almost completely um, demolished uh, old library um, mm -hmm. at, at JW and um, that was shared with Jason Burr and Tim Charleston and they were excited. This was uh, good news for them to see the, you know, the fact that it had already been done. And I just wanted to note that it, all of us are concerned about uh, anyone who's working at this time of crisis and the H&S team that is the contractor doing the work in uh, at JW, we did ask for and receive um, their uh, COVID-19 safety protocols and reviewed them and they're quite extensive and they had them ready before we even asked for them. So they've been um, very careful to make sure that their workers um, who during this work usually aren't close together. They're almost always wearing masks. Um, there's often uh, negative air pressure, um, but we wanted to make sure that um, the contractor was taking appropriate steps to ensure the safety of their workers while they're working on our project. In fact, they're not allowed to drive together. They all must arrive individually. They're, they're taking a lot of efforts to, as best they can, keep their workers safe while they continue to work. Thank you. Um, if Elizabeth's li listening, it would be great if we could pick, put those pictures of the demolition up on the website under the JW project so people could see it. It yeah, looks we'll make pretty. Sure get them, and I think Jason might include some of them in his letter to his. Yeah, family. that would be great. Good for people to see that. Um, if there's no questions. We'll move on to finance. Brian. Uh, well, I think the report posted online was a good a good summary. Um, I would just highlight that we had uh, a very interesting conversation about potential financial impacts of uh, COVID-19. Um, Dan um, gave us sort of a tutorial on the revenues that um, flow into New Jersey's budget and the, um, the, the challenges that the state is going to face on top of the ones that we already face. And um, Dan can say a bit about that, but obviously any reduction in state aid to schools would be very challenging. Um, we receive less state aid than many schools, but it still accounts to accounts for between four and five million dollars. And in addition to that, um, you know, somewhat unusual in, in states, but in New Jersey, um, many of the pension, Social Security, and other benefits are paid annually by the state. And for our um, district, that equals about $12.1 million. So there's about $16.5 million of uh, state money um, that, you know, uh, uh, undergirds the work of our, of our school district. And any reductions would pose um, significant challenges. Dan may say more. We did have some discussion about what levers might be pulled. Um, we don't have all that many big levers. Um, and one of the challenges is that the state doesn't allow us to um, build up a surplus greater than two or two and a half million dollars. So, um, you know, we really, if you will, live uh, our version of paycheck to paycheck through the combination of tax levy receipts and state aid. Dan, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, I, I would just say that financially on a state level, which impacts all public schools in New Jersey, we're in uncharted waters. Uh, New Jersey devotes about 40% of its $40 billion annual budget to uh, public education in one form or the, or the other. And even within that 40%, we have massive unfunded pension and uh, post-retirement health care cost liabilities. And so in the $2 trillion stimulus bill just passed, is about $150 billion to help with the states, but it doesn't appear to be nearly enough. And we don't know what uh, New Jersey's allocation is yet. And the state has, I mean, the federal government has its own challenges in terms of its uh, budget deficit, but at least it can uh, print money electronically which is a luxury that the states don't have. The states have to balance their budget 
and the states can't even restructure. And so going back to the 2007 and 8 financial crisis, California was actually giving out IOUs. And if we were to receive an IOU uh, from the state, it wouldn't help us uh, fill, fill any uh, particular budget hole that we might have. So we were literally in uncharted waters. We uh, passed a budget uh, to the county, but it was based on certain assumptions about state aid and, and other revenue and spending assumptions, which will likely have to be revisited. Now, the, Trump is already talking about a second stimulus package uh, promoted around infrastructure of, of equal size, two trillion dollars. And uh, so we can only hope that um, it will include more money uh, for states, particularly states that um, have great public education systems as New Jersey does, and that uh, in whose school districts depend so heavily on, on the state as our 585 school districts do. So it's something that uh, may come up very quickly in the next month or two because we have to uh, pass a budget for next year. And, uh, and the state has to find a way to close its budget deficit uh, for uh, 2019 and 2020, which ends at, at June 30th. And uh, so I think this is, you know, the second part of the crisis. We're working on the human element of the crisis, uh, which is health related. And uh, the second impact is really economic related. And, and we can't really fix that problem until we solve the health problem first. But it's going to be a big challenge uh, for states, particularly states like, like New Jersey. Uh, thank you, Dan. And just a reminder that um, it's, this is a challenge that's shared by districts across the state. Um, we're a bit less reliant on state aid than many districts. So um, this is a case where all of the public school districts in the state will be advocating together um, to ensure that you know, we do everything we can to maintain the quality of public education, which in the state overall is high. And obviously in Princeton, we think it's very high and we will um, fight um, to ensure that there are uh, no reduction in revenues that would diminish the quality of the education. And the finance committee's working with Matt, who's made great progress um, in less than a year and looking at um, uh, expenses top to bottom. And I think we've worked through maybe a quarter to a third of the categories in a reasonably thorough way with, with great progress that's been made on our prescription benefits. Um, obviously, healthcare costs are things that we have to continue to work to control. Um, but the finance committee is, um, well, I'm not sure there's another finance committee in the state that's quite as focused on uh, line by line review of, of expenses as we are. And um, we're going to be continuing to work on that vigilantly for the balance of the year. And, and Brian, if I could just add that, you know, for someone who doesn't understand school finance, they might think, well, the schools are operating remotely. We've shut the buildings down. We must be saving lots of money. Not necessarily the case. As you know, we talked about that this week as well as to what, what this does to us financially in terms of the, the shutdown. And it doesn't really offer a lot of opportunity for us to recapture uh, money other than potentially some on transportation, but that uh, remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, also, hope, yeah. we're hopeful ahead. that there might be some energy savings as well right. as we don't it's need so to, um, uh, you know, heat or cool the buildings to the same level. Um, uh, next time the facilities committee meets, we'll probably have a conversation with Dave Harding about other steps that are taken. You know, we have a pool that consumes energy. Um, so, but, but the, Matt and Dave are uh, focused on the operational side about anything that can be done to, to, to save, um, but it's a very challenging time. And the levers that we have um, just are not, they're not big ones. And we will have a resolution tonight again on something else that, you know, laws are being written overnight and we find out about them and they're already half passed. So this, there's a bill that has already been passed by the state assembly that allows local municipalities to hold back tax levy funds that are raised for the schools, uh, which is what, 85% or? 84. 84% of our budget. And we get it in, I think, what, three payments over the course of the year, three or four? And it's the extent, Hmm? 
uh, 20 payments over the year. 20 payments. So those are 20 payments of approximately $4 million. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? So what, so we accrue the money, I guess, right? If we don't get it, so we can accrue for the year. So what, what happens if, if this bill passes? If we hit, um, if our cash flow got too negatively impacted, then we would have to, the state has a mechanism where we can apply for uh, borrowing because generally we're not about to borrow. So that's what we would look to do. So we'd be monitoring closely um, our cash flow situation then. But, so if it, would, if it did pass, it, it doesn't mean, um, you know, operations would stop or kids wouldn't be educated or teachers no. wouldn't have jobs. No, it, it is tough though. The cash flow situation is tougher near the end of the year. So we get our tax levy equally throughout the year where the summer payroll is so much lower. Mm -hmm. So near the end of the year is where it's uh, a little, t a little tighter, but. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Um, personnel. Mm -hmm. um, yep. The personnel committee met on Wednesday, March 25th. Um, the search committee for the assistant principal at JW is interviewing candidates this week. The committee discussed in detail several per um, personnel positions for the 2020-2021 school year. The committee discussed the addition of an aid for Littlebrook for the 2019-2020 school year. The committee discussed creating a pilot program in one elementary school for our cafeteria and playground personnel for the 2020-2021 school year. The committee discussed the creation of several job descriptions, which will be on the agenda tonight, including a transportation assistant and a college and career counselor at PHS. The committee continued its discussion on our annual tenure process and how we will review our staff in an online format. And I just wanna say a final thank you to Lynn Harkness, whose last day with JW was yesterday. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Policy, Jess? Sure, so uh, policy committee met virtually. It was the first virtual committee meeting um, on the 18th. And Jean Harkness from NJSBA joined us um, and described the process um, just to review for everyone of moving to a single policy source, the NJSBA policy manual, and clarified that it is best practice for us to move to one set of policies as soon as possible. Um, continuing to revise and customize for Princeton as needed. Um, for any policies that we've held out, she is providing the legal requirements and then we can develop additional language going forward um, so that we're fully compliant. Um, the committee reviewed the 6000 series, um, making just small revisions and agreed to put forward the NJSBA versions of these policies for sh first reading tonight um, by the full board, so those are on the agenda. Um, and then, um, oops, sorry, my computer's freezing. Um, and the goal remains to have a full NJSBA manual of policies adopted um, by the end of this school year, and I think we're still on target to do that. Um, and thanks to Matt um, and Patty for working with us to, to get the requirements and to incorporate the comments um, that have come as late as today for, for the policies that are on the agenda tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one question. So do you guys in policy, after you put it up for a first reading, do you read them again for a second or is that just, do they just move into second? Uh, we incorporated all the comments of the board after the initial discussion of the first reading. Okay. And we are one, there was a sort of a global comment about um, gender neutral language. And we are, we have a system in place to be able to make sure that all of our policies all the way through will maintain that language um, through a check that we're going to do before everything goes on for final read. Great. Thank you. Oh, good. Yep. And Jess, if, if I recall from serving on the committee last year, um, while there's a lot of focus on getting the changeover um, complete, at any time, um, any board member or member of the public can request that the committee focus on a particular policy um, and suggest changes. So that that um, remains an ongoing opportunity. It's not the case that once we enact a new policy that it's static forever. No, 
Absolutely, we welcome that. And we have a whole list of questions that we have on some of these policies that just need more staff time that we don't have right now, but we need to get the policies in place. And we wanna make sure that they get a good close read. So we'll be coming back to them. And we also have a number of specific policies that we know need to get done, like technology, which keeps changing mm -hmm. as fast as I'm sure we <laughs> approaching it, then it just more than ever morphs ahead of us again. But but technology, for example, has been held back. Some of the bigger ones have been held back so that we can really do them properly and get get into the nitty gritty of them. Okay, anything else on policy? And we go to student achievement. Hey. Thank you. Uh, we met on virtually on the Zoom platform Friday, March 27th at 1130. Uh, the meeting was closed to the public, but we are looking to open the April meeting to the public as usual. I see many of our typical student achievement committee attendees are on this call tonight. So thank you for maintaining your interest in the work of the schools. Uh, we Annie presented a remote learning update. I won't repeat what she had said because she said so much of it for us again tonight. Um, but the committee is quite grateful for the incredible work of our staff over the past few weeks as the district has transitioned to remote learning. And as Daphne mentioned earlier in the meeting, we will speak with Mickey Crisofulli at our next meeting in April about how to really support our um, academically fragile students who are negatively impacted by this, um, who may be negatively impacted by remote learning. So more discussion to come on that and how to support these students. Um, we discussed some international trips. They are on the agenda this evening. You'll see there are four trips to France, Japan, Italy, and Morocco. Um, the trip to Morocco is being offered by the Visual and Performing Arts Department. The rest are offered through the World Language Department. Uh, we also discussed a proposed trip to Cuba. That will also be discussed further at our April 17th meeting. Please note, as part of our policy discussion um, that Jess was just presenting, Student Achievement will work with our policy committee on a revision of the district's field trip policy this spring, something we've talked about a lot in Student Achievement, and we will work on that this month. Uh, we had some visitors to our student achievement meeting from the staff, Marijula Bajaj, Supervisor of Science, and Rushi Mittal, a PHS chemistry teacher, joined our meeting to advocate for a new AP chemistry book. Our AP chemistry book is 10 years old, which is the oldest allowed by state law and the college board. Um, the textbook adoption committee at the high school evaluated four books by three different publishers and involved students in this review. They agreed that the current publisher is the one they'd like to keep. Uh, they are, they've asked to, pu to purchase the newest version of the book. It will be a bundle, which means six years of online access as well as a hard copy textbook. Purchasing one of the two is only $30 less than the $195 cost of each bundle, and the funds are earmarked in this year's budget. That is also on tonight's agenda. There was unanimous support from Student Achievement for this purchase. We then discussed closed session topics, and our next meeting will be on the Zoom platform April 17th. As I said, I will um, invite the public for the first hour at 1130, and I will publish that information on the calendar item. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Are there any questions for Betsy? Uh, uh, Michelle, go first. Um, my question is about the textbook purchase yeah. and the company that's selling the textbook. Would you happen to know what state that company is located in? I know it's the COTS. Is that correct, Annie? COTS? That's but I, I do not know the, the, the state. I do not know that. Uh, I could do a little Google research here. Yeah. Well, I'm asking because I know that that their that textbooks from a certain state tend to predominate the textbook market, and and there are some perspectives offered in those textbooks which are not um, inclusive in terms of instruction or in depictions of history. Or so I I was just curious to whether or not these textbooks come from that state. I can find that out for you. Okay. Um, so my question um, has to do with the overnight trips and there was a lot of back and forth um, on the committee. So generally travel insurance policies don't cover pandemics unless, unless it's an, a cancel for any reason policy, which is very expensive. So um, we spoke about having um, something to indicate that these policies might be canceled for any, re uh, these trips um, might be canceled for any reason, um, especially 
since we've all seen that it's very likely that the pandemic will return in the fall. So what steps um, are gonna be taken to ensure that our families don't lose money and um, you know, ev everyone is made whole in the event the trip has to be canceled? Do we have any idea from Matt, do you have any information on that? Um, it's the first um, hearing that question. Okay, um, we, had, we had discussed as a committee, as Daphne said, concern for our families that they wouldn't lose. You know, planning needs to begin now on these trips, which is why we're being encouraged to put them on the agenda. And um, Annie, I believe you and Jessica spoke about this? About, uh, yes, about the plan, yes. I think we need to get the planning going on all of these trips. Um, we're certain that we would get a refund on any deposit we put on, or we would make sure that we would be okay. able to in the event that the trip had to be canceled because of the, the, um, the situation okay. we're in. And so Matt, do you, do you see, I mean, I think we discussed that the board could approve these, um, with the understanding that there would be, as, as they're um, doing the planning, that we're, we're um, approving this contingent that there would be refunds for families. Is that possible? I, I think that should be how, how they are planned uh, at this point. We had talked before about student travel insurance, uh, but not about this particular uh, contingency. Yeah, I'm sorry, Matt. I thought you were on the emails. I guess the concern is so we'll, we, that's, this gets approved tonight. Tomorrow they start their efforts. I just want it to be clear um, that you know, it's what's the likelihood of this trip happening? Maybe 50%. Um, so I, our parents, um, I would like everyone to understand that, and then also, um, you know, ensure that the, any fees or deposits would be fully refundable. Thank you, Daphne, for bringing that up. Yeah, and we can go forward with that. Yeah. Great. I mean, I hope, I hope uh, you know, that's not the case. And I hope there's a cure, but. And as they are planned and move forward, that we look probably monthly about the feasibility of these trips happening so that. Yeah, absolutely, uh, right. We approach them or when they're planning, perhaps plan back dates further out. That's a good idea. Yeah, getting a refund because, you know, it's not just our kids going out. Like if our kids go out, are they going to be quarantined? Are they going to be able to get back? Right. Those yeah. types of right. issues, I think. And, and that we don't bring virus to another country that may be, uh, if we're under control, that another right. country is not under control. So I think there are a lot of issues as we move forward more than in a normal year of planning. It's true. Yeah. Um, relatedly, Steve and Annie, I don't know if you know um, the status of any refunds for families. I know there were two trips that were planned this spring. I don't know if we have any information on those. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Steve. Annie, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that that is on my to-do list <laughs> for this week uh, to start talking about, um, yeah, uh, what we're going to do about that. So, okay. yeah, I, I believe we did get refund because the one to Disney World was Disney World did get closed. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, we'll check on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. And you know, I, I'm, I'm in the midst of dealing with this now with with my with the company that I work for and, and, and we need to be so thorough about each each element of this, whether a, another government prohibits travel from a country, mm -hmm. um, there, there are all kinds of things that can that can throw a wrench into it. But one of the things that I think that we really need to think about is said if there's a 50% chance that the trip is not going to happen, I, I I really want us to be very careful about how we characterize this and how we because I hate disappointing kids and families and, and people who, who save money and work hard and, and they think this is gonna happen. And there are things that are beyond our control. But the likelihood is more, it's more likely that we're not gonna do the trip than do it. Then the planning just raises expectations and sets people up for disappointment. So I hope we keep that in mind and let's just be realistic about whether or not this is something that's gonna happen. 
Thank you. Yeah, and that's the big reason Daphne kept pushing that we need like insurance, we need to understand, we need to have bylaw, you know, something. I mean, that was the whole reason because we don't want to be caught and we want to make sure everybody knows from the front what's happening. Right. Because it, it, does, it doesn't, we are not in control of it at all. No, unfortunately. Right. All we right, also good. understand that with the planning comes an awful lot of work. So our staff, they're looking to engage in this planning because in a perfect world, they would like to you know, attend these trips um, mm -hmm. for the students. If we don't approve these trips, then no planning can happen and we're basically making the decision now. So we haven't been told officially that there's a certain percentage on whether or not these trips will happen, but three of them are in the fall. And so we do need to think, as you say, Michelle, that's very well said, very realistically um, for all involved. Right. And, and look at the timing of the trips and perhaps this fall is not the best timing as we move forward. Yeah. According to Dr. Anthony Fauci. <laughs> The only guy I listen to. <laughs> I think he, he, he at the moment is not recommending playing a trip today. But, but also to Michelle's point, you know, parents might just, if, you know, my child was going on one of these trips and the coronavirus came back, I'm not going to send them on that trip. So, you know, as a board, what expectations are we setting? Like, because we don't want to set these kids up for, you know, disappointment. Mm -hmm. which I think we all agree about. Well, I think before September, they can, like right now they can start the planning, but before September, right. we take another look and see the timing of these trips or whether it's worth moving them back to later timing. Right. Yeah. Um, is that some, may, perhaps that's something we add to student achievement every meeting, just to get a quick update on where mm -hmm. the trip planning is at mm -hmm. um, and, and, and maybe if decisions have been made. Mm -hmm. Just so we're on top of that. Mm -hmm. But maybe it might be a good idea just to echo what Susan said. Maybe they should look at the t changing the timing to early next winter, like February, March, when everyone. Just like during February break instead. Yeah. Or so, so just when they're doing that planning to be flexible in terms of the dates, because mm -hmm. I, I think we, you know, all is. I hope and pray that everything is great, but that's not what the science seems to be saying. So to be flexible in the planning of this. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I think that takes us to our very first um, attempt at a public forum on a Zoom board meeting. <laughs> And so I hope that everyone will be patient with us and, and we'll try to make this work for everyone. Um, Matt, I think what you planned was that Michelle, and Michelle, are you not muted? Let's just confirm that. Can we hear you? You can hear me. <laughs> Michelle <laughs> remains our, our expert timer who keeps us to on schedule. And so we invite the public to approach the board. The public is welcome to speak to us. Although this is not a discussion between the board and the public, we will listen um, and we will not be answering questions necessarily. Although if one of our administrators at the end wishes to comment, that would be, that would be fine. Um, and we ask that um, our speakers keep it to three minutes max and that you state your name and your address when you begin. And I think Matt, you wanna then explain to us how this is gonna work in this medium. So people have been reaching out to me. I have a list right now, uh, five people. I'm gonna call them in order. Anyone else out there um, that can hear me? So, you know, we've had to kind of do different things with the technology to make sure that we just don't have mass. There's been people coming in massly, but just, uh, just send me a message if you can online here and I'll put you on the list. Or if there, it doesn't look like I have too many people on phone only. So, but if you can send me an email, I'll put you on the list and then I'll unmute you. The first speaker we have is uh, Maria Wega. Um, I unmuted you, Maria. Can you uh, hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, offer some comments uh, regarding the uh, food distribution um, for the free and reduced lunch students. Um, I was present at the recent one. And uh, I, um, uh, I thank the superintendent for um, agreeing to some of the uh, changes that he mentioned. Um, 
and uh, especially including uh, increasing the frequency to a weekly distribution. Uh, ideally, um, I would personally like to see a bi-weekly distribution, which is what most of the districts seem to be doing, all the districts. I've checked the websites of uh, uh, districts like um, Franklin Township, South Brunswick, New Brunswick, uh, Trenton, etc. And um, they all seem to be doing bi-weekly distributions. And the reason why I would prefer to see that, and that was very clear this last week, was that uh, the weight of the boxes is, is um, uh, significant. Um, when you have more than two children, you're looking at 40, 40 plus pound, pounds per child. So it's really not very practical for families who have to walk several blocks to the uh, pick a point. Um, and I would also like or suggest that we warn these families that uh, they are going to, they should come in a car if they have one, uh, ask for a ride or bring carts to bring the, the boxes home. And that we ask some volunteers and I would be um, uh, happy to round up people who would be willing to carry the boxes in their cars uh, so that we make this easier. Um, in terms of the mix of food, um, uh, I was very glad to see some fruit and vegetables in, in this distribution. Um, ideally, I would like to see an increase uh, of fresh food. Uh, this would be another reason why going to a weekly or bi-weekly distribution would allow us to increase the proportion of fresh food uh, in the mix. Um, and also suggest that we provide uh, the necessary ingredients to provide a full meal. For instance, if we provide pasta, we should also be providing tomato sauce. If we provide cereal, we should be providing milk um, and um, give more variety. Basically, we've been providing uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for six weeks in a row to the kids for lunch and uh, that's far from ideal but thank you very much for what's being done i know um, it requires the effort of many people and uh, uh, but um, uh, this is something that as a district we're required to do and uh, and we should try to do as as best uh, the best job we can because these are the most vulnerable families in in our town thank you so much Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Okay, next I have, um, I have an email that I've been asked to read from Abigail Zoline, um, who would like to publicly express her concern that the district is not meeting federal lunch guidelines when feeding the free and reduced lunch students during COVID-19. Um, I have another, the third speaker I have is also an email from Jen Cohan, um, who's a resident and parent in our community. I'm gonna read it. Um, Since the COVID-19 shutdown, Princeton Public Schools has twice distributed unprepared food to children on the free and reduced lunch program. Either distribution has met federal guidelines for the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Program, which requires fluid milk, none of which has been distributed thus far. Additionally, the first distribution had a daily sugar count total of 69 grams. The American Heart Association states that kids two through 18 should have fewer than 25 grams of added sugar daily for a healthy heart. How are children who are juggling remote, uh, especially those with learning disabilities, supposed to concentrate with 69 grams of sugar coursing through their bodies? On March 20th, Governor Murphy signed into law A3840, which allows food to be provided to students for up to three days. I informed you all of this, but instead of following this law, like other districts that have more students and far fewer resources, the district lawyer was called in for an attempted workaround of the law. Steve doubled down with the second distribution. It was slightly healthier due to community activism and intended to last two weeks. It weighed 40 pounds per child. I know because I weighed them. At the community park distribution site, multiple mothers some pregnant others not fit to lug 40 more pounds to their homes showed up without transportation or carts 
they were unaware that PPS was, in the case of some families, bestowing 125 pound, 120 pounds of unprepared food upon them. This is extremely discriminatory toward anyone with a physical disability and blatant white supremacy and classism in action. I work in the food industry and I'm married to a chef. Food service is not that complicated. NutraServe can be told to order low sodium, low sugar foods and they can safely consolidate operations in a single kitchen to turn out fresh meals deliverable to children via school bus. Why in the past have you done PR, public relations about cafeteria food service improvements but now during a time of crisis, you turn around and turn your backs on low-income kids. Is it because they aren't rich or white enough? Don't donate to your campaigns or run in your social circles. Help me understand why a prestigious school district in a supposedly liberal town is acting this way. Please, I implore you to read any of the countless equity reports you've commissioned, Google Food Justice and School Lunches, or just look in the mirror and evaluate if you are truly walking the walk for our most vulnerable students. Thank you, end. Um, the fourth speaker uh, is Kip Cherry. I have to unmute her. Kip, let us know when you're live. Are you gonna do anything with my picture? I'm just gonna be, it's okay. We have your uh, name up there. It says Kip Cherry. Hi, Kip. <laughs> I don't know what happened to my picture. Uh, I'm Kip Cherry, as you all know. Uh, special thanks to uh, Steve and Annie's uh, work and their reports and all of your work and everybody's efforts and Matt uh, for setting all this up. I want to congratulate you on ramping up with Zoom and reaching out to the public. I think that um, this creates a level of normality in what we're all doing, which I think is a good thing to keep things rolling. Uh, my hope is that you could do the same with the facilities and finance committees. Um, I think you will find that uh, public input will um, using Zoom will be very beneficial to the uh, tough decisions that lie ahead. Uh, I want to express my concern ongoing uh, regarding the referendum being over budget. Um, I know you all know about this, but I just need to uh, mention it and um, you know, note that this is even before proceeding with the uh, major portion of the uh, PHS uh, referendum. So uh, we're really uh, in arrears. I note that we are, um, over budget about half a million dollars overall and uh, within the total construction budget itself, uh, we're over $730,000, which is an extraordinary amount. Uh, I note that um, there has been some feeling that steel tariffs might have affected this, um, but I think it's very important to get to the bottom of what's going on and I think that will help you uh, moving forward as well to understand better uh, what's been happening cost-wise. And um, I would recommend to you that you bring in your HVAC engineers face to face and ask their opinion as to why uh, there are such overages. And um, they may not know all the answers, but I think it would be good to ask them. And um, I would also bring in Spiesel's cost estimator so that you have a better understanding of uh, the budget estimates that have come from Spiesel, uh, which are different from what I would call professional cost estimates. Um, I'm also concerned about the growing unencumbered soft costs. And I know Matt mentioned um, the uh, EPIC issue. And I think that we need to understand that better because um, I thought that their contract was for the, the duration. Although I do recall a discussion about adding a third uh, person for the summer. And, and, and I think that was an additional service. So I understand that. Um, in reading it, the budget, I, I note that uh, both Epic and Spiesel seem to be uh, already fully have spent out the, what are the amount that's budgeted for them. And again, this is before PHS. So I, I could be reading it wrong, but this is the way I read it and I'm very concerned about it. Um, I also want to mention a couple other things real quick. Uh, first of all, um, the construction folks uh, who are doing the, the work, the labor, um, they need to really know how to, to take off their masks properly so they're not getting um, whatever is on the mask onto their face. They need to wash their faces. Same with taking off the gloves. And you may assume that everybody knows how to do this, but I can tell you that at home, we've been talking about and experimenting with getting a mask off without smearing it on our faces and everything. It takes a knack. You have to really practice it. And it's serious because you could have stuff on your mask that you get on your face that you were trying to protect yourself from. And finally, I just wanna mention on the state education budget, please keep the public informed because we can help. Um, I know Bateman, I know Greenstein, and if we need help in the, um, in the Senate, please just give me the bill number and I will talk with them. They are bipartisan, you know, uh, uh, Bateman is a Republican and Greenstein is Democratic. 
uh, Democrat. Jim, thank and, you very much for your comments. Um, we you appreciate so be this. sure to let us know. Don't keep us in the dark. Thank All righty. You. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the fifth speaker, I have uh, Mary Clerman, uh, but she had to leave. So it's very uh, quick. I'll read it very quickly. Uh, she would like to know what Princeton Public Schools is looking at for possible opportunities for new approaches to learning, considering state budget costs and possible deficits, as well as what you might learn during the pandemic. Other teaching methods, question mark more independent learning, some more successful approaches to distance and independent learning, question mark. It's good questions, we thank you, Mary. Uh, and I had one more comment uh, from uh, Linda Oppenheim. She wanted to ask uh, if Princeton Public Schools, us as a board, can encourage parents to complete the census. Um, I have mine at home. I will be doing it any moment. Um, <laughs> I think we're all in support of that. I've heard it mentioned numerous times since I've been here in seven plus months. So, thank you. Um, just double checking. Uh, I don't have any emails or any other messages to speak. Oh. So now Mary says she's here. I can unmute you. It's okay now. Too late. Too late. You did, you did a good job. Thank you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I didn't mess up. I do want to say I, I think that this this way of doing things is less remote feeling than than the normal situation. <laughs> well, good. We thank you. Okay. Uh, can we just give the website for the census, which is 2020census.gov, as long as we're talking about it? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I will say okay. filling it out online was very easy. And Super very easy. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Very easy. Agree. And everyone should have their letter by now. Mm -hmm. um, I think April 1st is it. So if you don't see a letter from the census folks by the end of the week, it's probably worth checking in on that website. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I think then we can move on to uh, our regular business items. Um, thank you everyone for your and for, for trying the new technology and, and sharing, sharing your comments with us. It's always really helpful to hear from, hear from you. And we will be trying to open our committee meetings. Um, Matt, did you want to say something? Uh, just real quick, uh, as we're going to move through the agenda items now, if anyone wants to speak at the last public, uh, just message me and I'll put you down on the list and go ahead. Uh, President uh, Barron, sorry. Okay, um, great. So the next item is K-1, policies that are up for a first reading. Um, and this is an action item. And these are, again, part of the transition of the policy manual. We are doing the entire 6,000 series to try to get ourselves into one co coherent policy manual from the NJSBA. So do I, have, um, do I have a motion to discuss this item? I have a motion, please. I can't see anyone, so could oh, you just- I have Jess. Jess, <laughs> Jess? Mm -hmm. and a second. a second. Brian. Brian is second. I only have still pictures of everyone, so I don't see anything you're doing. So we just have to do this orally. Um, is there any discussion? If not, um, can we have, why don't we do a roll call, Matt? Yeah, I think that's the best way to do it in this scenario. Beth Barron? Yes. Debbie Bronfeld? Yes. Dan Dart? Yes. Jess Deutsch? Yes. Betsy Baglio? Yes. Brian McDonald? Yes. Michelle Tuck Ponder? Yes. Peter Katz? Yes. Daphne Kendall? Yes. Susan Cantor. Yes. Motion passes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. And then next item K2 is the, um, the policies, uh, the 5,000 series that are up for a second reading, which is the final reading. Um, again, can I have a motion? Jess. Thank you. Jess is a motion. Can I have sure. a second? Peter. Peter. Peter, second. Thank you. Any discussion? Yeah, I have one more thing. So, Matt, I just noticed on 5142, you, you crossed out the thing I had an issue with. So, when you redo it, do you just take that out completely? Yeah, we wanted to mm -hmm. show the redaction so you guys could see that, you know, we were reflecting. It's tracked because it was right up to the end. Yeah. Okay, super. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. If there's no further discussion, can we have a roll call? Beth Barron? Yes. Debbie Bronfeld? Yes. 
Dan Dart? Yes. Jeff Stoich? Yes. Betsy Baglio? Yes. Brian McDonald? Yes. Michelle Tuckponder? Yes. Peter Katz? Yes. Daphne Kendall? Yes. And Susan Cantor? Yes. A right, motion passes unanimously. Thank you everyone for your cooperation and your help with those today. I know we've had a lot of comments, but people are really all pitching in and it's great. It takes all of us, there's so many of them, so it's really helpful. Um, next item is L. We're going through our personnel items and now these are consents and I'm going to go quickly. I guess if I won't go as quickly as usual, if you have something, please try to speak up and stop me. If you have a question. Um, so L1 is a consent item. It is the um, appointments for 1920. <clears throat> L2 is the consent item for stipends. L3 is substitute teacher. L4, curriculum and instruction. L5, leave of absences. L6, resolution to create new position. L7, job description, registrar. L8, job description, college and career counselor. Then we're going on to item M1, student day field trips. Item two, textbook approval. This is the chemistry and chemical reactivity one we talked about. I'm item sorry, Madam Chair, can we pull the, um, that's part of the consent agenda, the, the um, a student overnight trips. That's the next one. We, it would, yes, we just, we were just getting to that, the overnight. Okay. Sorry about that. I'd like to have that pulled. Or okay. Separate. Iron M3, the mm -hmm. student overnight trips to Japan, Italy, and France. Yep. would like that to be a action item? Mm -hmm. Separate? I would. Yes. Matt, can we do that? Sure. And just to clarify, those are the three for the fall. Of yep. 2020. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, great. Do we have a motion on those two items? That item M3, the student overnight trips to Japan, Italy, and France. Can I have a motion? Betsy. Betsy, a second. Susan. Susan, um, any discussion? Um, I, my discussion is Michelle, is I think that our primary responsibility is to ensure the safety of our kids. And I, I know that these trips are important to learning. I know it's something that kids look forward to. Um, and I'm just really concerned of that we don't know the trajectory of this illness. And, I'm, and I know we're talking about starting planning, but I really just don't, think it's fair to raise expectations um, when things are so uncertain at this time. And so I'm just not going to be able to support it. So that's, that's my explanation for that. I just have too many concerns. Um, I'll make another comment. This is Betsy. We've talked about, you know, many overnight trips to international destinations the last few years, and we tightened up some not tightened up so much as um, articulated our procedure, which is that the superintendent has the ability, even if the board says yes and the insurance company says yes, the superintendent always has the ability to cancel um, a trip and that that responsibility lies with the superintendent. So just to be clear for my colleagues, um, but I, I, I just want to make that clear. Thank you. Thanks, Betsy. That helps to know, Betsy. Thank you. So any, any further discussion on that? Then I think, um, does someone want to call the question? Um, we have a motion, we have a second. So can I have, can we have a vote? Beth Barrett? Matt? Yes. Debbie Bronfeld? <laughs> yes. Dan Dart? Yes. Jess Deutsch? Yes. Betsy Bagwell? Yes. Brian McDonald? Yes. Michelle Tuckponder? No. Peter Katz? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Daphne Kendall? Yes. Susan Cantor? Yes. Our motion passes nine to one. Thank you. Um, item M4 is the overnight trip to Morocco. And this one is also an action item. Can I have a motion, please? 
Betsy. Betsy, second. Peter. Peter, thank you. Any discussion? If no discussion, could we have a vote? Beth Barron? Yes. Debbie Bronfeld? No. Dan Dart? No. Jess Deutsch? Yes. Betsy Baglio? Yes. Brian McDonald? Yes. Michelle Tuck Ponder? No. Peter Katz? Yes. Daphne Kendall? No. Susan Cantor? Yes. And the motion passes six to four. Um, next item, M5, is a consent. It is the purchase of textbook and really related materials to chemistry. Do we, this is the same one we had before. It must be a different one. Um, we have to approve the book and then we have to approve the purchase. Right. <laughs> the first is the title, correct. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. And M6 is the Curriculum Instruction um, Princeton Educational Foundation Equity in Our Schools grant. Um, can I have a motion? Oh, sorry, that's a consent. Can I just can I say something about that? Um, I just think we we want to express our gratitude here for this significant grant that's coming through the um, from um, the educational foundations, and I think that's from an anonymous donor for purposes of equity. And anyone else want to say something about that, Steve? Just tremendously grateful that we're, we're able to get the funds for um, providing computers for our, our K through three um, students who were not able to um, to have those, um, both the internet and the and the devices. And that's for the there's two I actually right. Yeah, and then there's number seven as well. Yeah, additional the yeah. high school summer program. Right. And Beth, just to confirm. What we're being asked to approve is a gift from uh, the fund, Princeton Children's Fund? No, PEF. P -E oh, the Princeton Education Foundation. Yes. And, and they're a separate entity, and they have the full requirements of ensuring that um, the gift acceptance complies with all federal and state guidelines, including the Patriot Act, correct? Oh, good question. They've given us money before, though, so you you didn't bring that up before. Uh, I, I've not been aware that we have received, um, in this particular gift, it has been mentioned three times that there's an anonymous donor, mm -hmm. um, which is fine. The donor can't be anonymous to the federal government. Um, so I just want to make sure that um, either, A, we accept gifts as a matter of uh, uh, practice from any you know, bona fide uh, mm -hmm. 501c3 duly um, recognized organization and where their gifts came from does not matter to us or it does matter in which case we would want to do more research. I suspect we're in the, the prior case um, and that we're I want to make sure that um, because you know mention has been made that this is anonymous um, that uh, we're just certain that we have no um, uh, concerns uh, legally or in terms of public relations um, uh, about who the originating donor or donors are. If I could um, just speak to it because I was involved um, in helping the district um, obtain that money back in uh, 2018. I know that um, Stephanie Kennedy, who was the BA at the time, worked with the district's lawyers um, because um, the donor um, was clear that uh, they wanted this to be anonymous. Um, so um, there, are board, there are board members and administrators who are aware who the donor is. Um, and so I don't understand where the Patriot, <laughs> Patriot Act is coming in um, at this point. But well, there are actually um, a whole body of uh, federal and state laws, including the Patriot Act, that govern gift acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just trying to make sure we're exercising caution. Um, from my perspective, as a former fundraising professional, we're accepting a gift from the Princeton Education Foundation, period. End of discussion. If they want to um, you know, express their gratitude to an anonymous donor, um, they're welcome to do so. It's not important to us um, to uh, necessarily 
Well, either it is or it isn't important. And if our attorneys say it's not important, then it's, it's, well, it's not no, important. No, no, I'm not saying, I don't know that this issue came up. I'm just saying at the time when we were in discussions, and this, these are discussions that were going on for 18 months. Um, Steve, if you remember, I think we always knew it was going to be anonymous. Yes. But, but Daphne, the, the, the donor is known to us. Is that correct? The donor wishes to be anonymous publicly. But, but Princeton Board of Education is familiar with the donor. Yes. Yes. I mean, the superintendent is at the board in 2018, I believe. Mm -hmm. right. Was. Yes. 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 But to Brian's point, we're accepting a donation tonight from the Princeton Education Foundation. In the answer is yeah. yes. Okay. All right. Um, so then that takes us to N1, placement One of special- second. I'm not sure Brian's question was addressed. I'm a little confused as before we move forward. So, so Brian's issue was that because this gift was made to PEF, it's PEF's obligation to ensure that that donor is in compliance with the Patriot Act, correct? Not yes. Princeton Public Schools. Yes, they absolutely have the legal obligation to ensure that that um, donation that they have accepted, we're not accepting a donation from the anonymous donor, that the right. donation that they have accepted complies with all state and federal statutes and that their reporting requirements are fulfilled. Um, we do not have that requirement because we are, it's like we're getting the gift from the Princeton Education Foundation. Right, um, that's right. Uh, the fact that it's known is a good thing. There are a lot of, uh, donors um, or people who wish to you know make gifts um, who have a variety of motivations you know non-us donors and even domestic donors um, and so you, gift acceptance has become a very uh, serious part of uh, philanthropy and um, institutional management of uh, of charitable gifts but that's not our pro that's not our problem that's pef's problem correct yes legal i mean okay that is my understanding. Um, I, I, can't, I can't provide legal advice. If it weren't, then we would have an issue with every single donation we got, and we don't know where any of their money ever comes from, and that's not our responsibility. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And so, Brian, okay. I think you're asking a more general question. It only comes to light here because it's an anonymous donor. But in reality, anytime we get money from a foundation or other source, we don't know where those sources came from. Well, I just find it very unusual that we're making a big deal that this – that the, the originating donor wishes to remain anonymous when we have accepted many other gifts from PEF and PCF where, and, and other organizations where we've never even had discussions about who the originating donors were. So this strikes me as unusual. Unless we wanna somehow signal our gratitude to an anonymous donor, um, which I guess is fine as long as some members of the board and the superintendent um, you know, uh, feel that that's appropriate and that um, they're happy to be receiving gifts from a particular entity that's not known to the public or the full board. Well, I think it could be known to the full board. I'm not sure why that hasn't, I mean, I wasn't here last year. I don't know why that wasn't shared. You've accepted gifts from this via this mechanism before. We have, we yeah. have. All I've, raised, I've raised the same question in the past. You know, I just don't understand why we make a big deal about an anonymous donor. Um, well, either, maybe either that doesn't matter. But it's okay. because, Brian, the donor wishes to remain anonymous publicly. They would not, they don't want their name attached to it because other organizations could solicit them for other donations. There are many donations, individual and institutional that don't, they want to make donations anonymously. The point is, publicly speaking, it's anonymous. But for board members, it's not anonymous. They have disclosed themselves to us. I'm unaware of that. I do not have that information. We can talk about offline. Um, okay. And I would just say, I, look, I've lectured on this topic. I've written on this topic. Um, you know, there are, uh, institutions across the country right now that are figuring out what to do with the Sackler name. Um, so th there is one, you know, school of thought that says that any gift to a 501c3 
is a fully sanitizing process and we don't care about you know, where the money came from. Another school of thought is that we should care whether it comes from a tobacco company or whether it comes from you know, uh, the sale of opioids. I'm sure that's not the case here. I'm, I'm just saying that such a big deal has been made about this being an anonymous donor. It would raise for fundraising professionals a certain amount of questions. And as a former fundraising professional, not knowing who the donor is, I'm merely asking questions about why we're making such a big deal about that. I, I fully understand why people wish to remain anonymous. While corporations wish to remain anonymous, why foundations and governments and you know sometimes wish to remain anonymous. I get all of that. They cannot be anonymous to the federal government, just to be clear about that. They right. cannot. And I think we understand your point. And I'm I think we're happy to talk. I'm happy to talk to you offline and, and, and about this donor. But I think that the intention here was simply to express gratitude to an entity that stepped up and saw a need that we had right. very quickly when we had to bring in these machines for our youngest students and we didn't have the funds. So I think we were grateful for that and that's the only reason we're speaking about our gratitude, <laughs> nothing more than that. It's a complicated uh, legal environment, gift acceptance. And I, I assuming that. that it's a, a bona fide donor in good standing, I, I express my own gratitude. Great. Thank you. Um, can we move on now to N1, placement of special ed students? Yes, consent item. Next item, 01, financial reports. Uh, 02, uh, community park change order, the security vestibule. Item three, renewal of transportation contract. Item four, renewal of athletic transportation 2021. Item five, uh, opposing delay in transmission of quarterly property tax revenue in school districts. This is the resolution we spoke of earlier. Now this is an action item. So can I have a motion for this? This is item 05, the resolution on the uh, state statute. I'll make a motion. Peter. Brian, second. Brian, second. Any discussion? Yeah, so before we vote, um, we would, what we're doing is announcing this and then where does it go from here? I think that's where I'm, does this go to our, our public um, professionals or? Yeah, I think the idea would be that this came from the NJSBA as a suggested um, resolution this morning. Mm -hmm. and. So we adopted it and customized it to our own um, situation, simply putting in our numbers. But I think the idea would be then we would we would send this on to our elected representatives at the state level. Okay. Um, and we also let NJSBA know that we're joining them in this, right? Yeah, and I think we might want to also reach out to the Garden State Coalition, uh, okay. and, and also, you know, as Kip mentioned, we can mention we can reach out to members of our community who may wish to help advocate on our behalf. So right. tell Kip, it's A3902. Yeah. <laughs> and if there's any question, the, the last two resolves um, specify who the resolution will be delivered to. Yeah. yeah. This, I, just if I can add real quickly, this, I, I mean, this is one of the most um, uh, damaging uh, pieces of legislation that I've seen, having sat on a school board now for much of the last 10 years. Um, I can't imagine what turmoil this would uh, send every school district into if this is enacted. Now, I understand that there have been some changes on the fly um, that I've seen recently that kind of try to minimize some of the damage to school districts, um, but still it, it is, um, it's uh, yeah. almost elastic terrorism. Yeah, the goal is to try to get the Senate to um, have amendments to the resolution before it passes and then give it back to the assembly. Um, when I was on the call with, and, and Matt listened also, they don't even think a lot of the legislators actually read through or understood what they, the implications of what they were voting for. I think they didn't, they were voting for perhaps a delay in payments of bills to vendors and very different than delay of payments to your schools. Did Cranberry do this too, Peter? Uh, we we haven't because we haven't met since this came out, which is just a few days ago. But um, I, I believe I mean we certainly intend to put it up to the, to a vote, and I would be shocked if it didn't pass there as well. Good. We received it this morning, so um, you know, Steve, it might be something you want to mention to your other superintendents for their boards. Oh, I definitely to will. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're meeting on Friday. Are we ready to take a vote? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm assuming this is unanimous. Is there anyone that does not want to vote yes for this? Which? It's unanimous. Number five. You want to just run, do a roll call just sure. for process? Absolutely. Beth Barron? Yes. Debbie Bronfeld? Yes. Dan Dart? Yes. Beth Deutsch? Yes. Betsy Baglio? Yes. Brian McDonald? Yes. Michelle Tuckwander? Yes. Peter Katz? Yes. Daphne Kendall? Yes. Susan Cantor? Yes. It is unanimous. Thank you. Um, that takes us to the consent agenda. Um, could I have a motion, please? Jess. Jeff? A second? Brian. Brian? Oh. Second is Brian. To slow down. <laughs> okay. Any so can I uh can we have a roll call on the consent agenda? Beth Barron? Yes. Debbie Bronfeld? Yes. Dan Dart? Yes. Jess Deutsch? Yes. Betsy Baglio? Yes. Brian McDonald? Yes. Michelle Tuck Ponder? Yes. Peter Katz? Yes. Daphne Kendall? Yes. Susan Cantor? Yes. The consent agenda. Uh, consent, consent agenda <laughs> passes unanimous. Easy for you to say. <laughs> Thank you. Now uh, we're on to our second public comment. Matt, take it away. <laughs> so, so far I have uh, Kip wanted to talk about that bill. Oh, I shouldn't speak for Kip. I don't <laughs> see her. Oh, Kip, are you still alive? I'm still here. Yeah, I think I'm still alive. <laughs> you only get three minutes per night. Okay. So, <laughs> so I looked it up and uh, it was the lead sponsor is uh, Benji Wimberly, who's from Patterson. And goodness knows Patterson schools need every dollar in the cash flow they can get. And uh, my firm designed a wonderful school for them. So I don't understand, uh, you know, what was going on there. And uh, I will approach his office. Um, it was voted on 79 to one not voting. So everybody voted for it for, for some, I mean, it's just bizarre and it didn't seem to have gone through any committees yeah. and it's, there's no Senate version at this point. Hmm. So that's, that's good. Yeah. And um, I, I'm planning to talk with uh, Shane Mitchell this week. Uh, he's legislative director for Senator Weinberg, um, who's very important in the Senate and I will bring that up with him with my other list. So, um, and I'll also touch on Bateman and uh, Greenstein. So I, I think we should be able to send this thing on to uh, to uh, Bill Heaven. <laughs> Thank you, Kip. Thank you. Thank you, Kip. Thank you. Thank you. That's Anyone it. Else? Okay. Thanks, Kip. Anyone else, Matt? I have no other uh, requests. Um, no. Okay. Um, if there's no other uh, comment, then I think that moves us on to our next item, which is uh, we're going into another closed session. Um, Can I just talk before we go on? Yep. Um, so I just wanted to thank Matt for um, all his efforts with um, yeah. all these meetings. Um, so separate links yeah. really has made um, my life so much easier. Um, and just really pulling this off today. It's incredible. Um, the care you took just to make sure everyone, everyone from the public had a chance um, to weigh in if they wanted to. It, it, you did a great job, Matt. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Um, and now I would ask for a motion to go into closed. Move. Michelle. I have Dan Dart and then and Dan. second. And Good Dan. <laughs> <laughs> not, not my point, Beth. You, um, I took over there. Sorry. I think I heard the second from Michelle. Michelle, yeah. Are we getting another invite for the closed? How does that work? We did. Betsy sent it. Oh, oh thanks, Betsy. Okay. So yeah. we're all going to get off of this call, and then we're going to get on to the um, link that Betsy gave us for our closed. All right. Thanks to everybody who joined us. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. public. We miss you. Be well. <laughs> yeah. Be well. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye.